Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, 3D stereoscopic photography. Um, 2D and 3D photography began almost in the same years in the first half of the 19th century. This is because the initial idea was try to replicate the depth, the same sensation that we have naturally in the, in the pictures. And Charles Whetstone was a famous figure at that time developing the first concept and the major concept of uh, 3D photography. Then, since then, more than 50 manufacturers created um, two camera, uh, two lenses camera that were capable of getting two pictures at the same time and printing them on a stereo card. And people in the first half of the 20th century uh, usually had this stereo viewer at home and they could see those images. Then later on, uh, with the uh, popularization of movies and televisions in 2D, and uh, because always with 3D photography, you need to wear a special glasses or special lenses, the interest in 3D declined uh, up to now, I would say. It had its ups and downs in the, in, in the last century. I can point here the Viewmaster that sold more than a billion reel, uh, reels and one 100 million viewers, uh, especially in the United States, and Walt Disney Corporation that uh, was always famous of displaying high quality 3D videos, but just in their facilities. And then the interest um, grew again um, in the last decades, especially with the IMAX producing this uh, new movie projection system capable of uh, getting 3D to the movies, and later on, uh, the major motion, motion pictures were released in 3D, and nowadays, in the last years, manufacturers such as Sony, Samsung, and LG began doing uh, three, uh, releasing 3D-capable TV screens that we, we can all have home, and now everybody can uh, see high-quality 3D videos at home. So now the, the interest is, is becoming, uh, is, it is raising again. So the first thing is trying to differentiate what is perspective 3D than what is stereo photography 3D. The perspective 3D, also called like the fake 3D, it's a, it's a bi-dimensional image, but that the artist can use many, uh, a number of ways, so the objects inside the scene appear to have depth. But it is still uh, um, a two-dimensional image, and uh, the objects are not really in different depths. You just have this illusion of depth. The stereo photography uh, or the real 3D can only happen if you have two images and deliver one image to each eye. This uh, replicates what happens uh, uh, with us when, when we are naturally seeing a scene. Because of each eye is in a different position, each eye has a different point of view and gets a slight different perspective from each scene. And both images are carried to our uh, visual cortex at the occipital lobe, and then they are fused together. And because of this slight difference, we have the uh, perspective, each object, each object in a different depth. So let's begin with the concepts. These are the two images that uh, the, the, the different eyes can get from a scene. And you can see that uh, the objects from one image to the other, they move a little bit its position horizontally. Objects that are, that are closer to the viewer, they move a little bit more than objects that are more far away from the viewer. And this is more different of position. It what tells the brain how close the object is for the viewer. And so uh, 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 what the brain does that he puts in order what is moving more, it would be closer to the viewer. What is moving less would be flat or really far away from the viewer. What, when you are getting the image to do the, the, the 3D photography, you need to get two images. So you need to slide the camera you take one picture, and then you slide the camera and take the second picture. This is traditionally done with these uh, uh, sliding bars. 
And the question is, how much do you move the, your, your camera? There are charts, but it's a well-known rule to move one thirtieth of the distance. So if you are like uh, in a certain distance, uh, if you move one thirtieth of this distance, it will get the real depth of the scene. But you can manipulate this. If you can increase the distance between those two pictures of those two cameras and uh, make the objects look a little bit more far away from each other. It's like taking a picture of a room, it will resemble as a, as a corridor. If you bring the cameras more far away, it will appear to have more depth. The, the, the image will stay more far away from each other. You are increasing the interaxial distance of both cameras. Another thing that we can control in 3D is where the objects will appear. This is called parallax, it is a 3D concept, and the zero parallax is the object that is going to stay at the depth of the screen. Everything that was positioned ahead of the screen will appear to be towards the viewer when he's seen, and the objects that are more far away will, will stay behind the screen. You can select uh, the point that is going to be at the depth of the screen by converging both cameras to this point. So if you convert, for example, here to the soccer ball, then the soccer ball will stay in the, at the depth of the screen, and then uh, the tennis ball will stay uh, in front of the screen. And if you convert the camera to a more f a forward point, everything is going to be behind the screen. This is something you can uh, uh, control. Uh, depends on what you want, uh, how you want to present those images. A number of ways have been uh, uh, released, so you can get the two cameras, the more traditional ones, the first one, the sliding bar, so you have more control of the scene, you take one picture, slide the camera and take the second picture, but there are more, uh, there are easier ways to get uh, uh, the pictures, there are adapters that you can put in front of your cameras, they already take the both images, and there are already cameras that take automatically these two images uh, for photography or for filming, now it's, it's pretty much easier. And solutions have been made to, for our uh, operating rooms, putting cameras, inside, uh, 3D cameras inside the surgical microscope. In the center you can see the, the Leica the, uh, 3D camera, it was uh, the first one you had to put between the lenses of your surgical microscope. Uh, and you could get both images. Nowadays, they have complete solutions sold, like a True Vision that uh, already sells a uh, surgical microscope. It's, it's pretty much easier and you can film uh, all your surgery. After you get both images, the next question is how you're going to mount the images. It's going to depend on how do you want to present them or what kind of software is going to read the image because each software demands uh, a certain way to you mount the image. You can make them independent, just left and right. You can put them together. We're talking uh, later about uh, the anaglyphs. You can put it side by side. And there are a number of ways you can do it. Depends on the software and how you want to present this. With digital photography, everything um, started to be much easier and with a higher quality. Uh, because of digital photography, especially, we can we can make compositions in in one slide. You can put different uh, uh, images at the same slide, and you can put labels. You can put arrows. You can make the arrows look in 3D, and uh, um, it has a number of advantages. But it was a major uh, a major thing for the 3D. So after you mount, you you take the pictures, you mount the pictures, and the next tricky thing that is it's like um, how you do this to work is how to get the left image to get inside the left eye and not to the right eye and how to get the right image to the right eye and not to the left eye. This is the tricky part and a number of ways have been described. Uh, I think every, everybody have seen the anaglyph. The anaglyph is, uh, is when you get the both images, you color the left image with red and you color to the right image with cyan is kind of blue and then you print both together when you don't wear glasses they usually have like a, a, a rim or the, uh, the boundaries of the objects look, uh, look with these other colors but once you put the glass uh, 
because the two uh, the two colors are opposite the uh, the left eye we only receive the left image and the right eye we only receive the right image and in your brain you will replicate this uh, 3d perspective this is very cheap this is very easy but on, and can be printed that is very good you can print on journals on magazines but one of the the drawbacks one of the limitations that the colors they don't look nice especially the red and uh, the human body because of the blood and muscles have a lot of red so it's not uh, ideal for medicine uh, whoever is familiar with uh, adobe photoshop software it's really easy to do you just have to replace the red channel from the right image by the red channel of the left image you just paste it from the left image and and you would just copy from the the left image and paste on the right image and it's really straightforward it's very easy and if you put the anaglyph glasses you're going to see this on 3d we have uh, reported this uh, this way of doing this in a technical note of journal of neurosurgery so uh, another way of mounting and showing the pictures is put them side by side. You create like a stereo pair. You can put the left image in the left position, the right image on the right position. And if you can keep your eyes, even with the naked eye, directly to the, to the images, you can see these on 3D with parallel or cross view. But it's much easier if you have uh, some special lenses or viewers. So you don't get discomfort with your eyesight. You just look uh, directly into the viewer and this will bring the left image to the left eye and the corresponding to the right eye. For the computer, it's also very easy. We just do a stereo card, left image on the left, right image on the right, paste it on uh, PowerPoint, and then we project using two different projectors. In front of one projector, we use a filter that, uh, um, that uh, it's a polarizing filter that just allows uh, the light to be conveyed horizontally. And uh, in the other uh, projector, we put the same filter rotated 90 degrees, so it, it will just allow the, um, the light to be carried on vertically. And then we project this in a silver screen that prevents the image to get to to be depolarized, and then it it, it 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 reflects to the viewer who is carrying the same kind of lenses. So in this, uh, like this, the image that is being projected by uh, by one projector will only get in one eye, and the other eye will only get uh, the image from the other eye. This is excellent for projections. It's cheap to it's, uh, it's very good for colors, but uh, unfortunately it cannot be printed. So it's, it's more for lectures. This is our setup. We have two projectors, a silver screen that uh, prevents the, the, the light to be depolarized. And then the viewers uh, is gonna wear, they're gonna wear glasses just like the movie theaters. Uh, we have also reported this technical uh, way of doing this in journal neurosurgery. Another way that has been used by the 3D TV is the field sequential technique. So one image is displayed, uh, uh, the images are displayed sequentially, first the right, then, then uh, the left, then the right, then the left, and the viewers wear active glasses. They're called active because they use batteries, and what happens then, um, the glasses are blinking, opening and closing according to each uh, image that is being shown. It happens in a high rate, so you don't, you don't see it blinking, but the fact that uh, it just opened when the left image is being presented, the left eye, and according to the, to the right image. This is very good, this is, but it's, it's not so cheap because the active glasses are not so cheap, and if you have a, a lot of people watching the, uh, uh, a movie theater, for example, it's gonna, it's gonna be more expensive. Another interesting way of printing 3D is called the lenticular method. You probably have seen on maybe in a movie theater, they usually print in, in, in big screens and they have light coming from behind. 
uh, in the lenticular method, the 3D picture has small bumps on its surface. And what happens that if you face it uh, forward and, and, and look it straight forward, uh, the left eye will only see the left half of the bumps and the right eye will only see the right half of the band of the bumps so the makers they they print the image accordingly so one eye would just see one image and the other eye would just see another image and it appears very nice but it, it's, it, it's just for printing and you need light coming from behind it's uh, it's beautiful but it's not that cheap and now with the 3D TV, everything began to be much easier. You can just buy it and that's it. And they are not so expensive if you compare to the other 3 TVs, to the other normal uh, 2D TVs. And uh, they have for active glasses, these are uh, um, when, when uh, the, the glasses, they use batteries. It's a little bit uh, higher quality than the passive glasses, passive glasses. Just uh, LGs making TV screens that use passive glasses. And they're already coming up with no glasses TV, 3D TV screens where they probably have the bumps um, over the surface. Now, uh, the future of 3D is going to be um, about 3D modeling, but not in this artistic way that uh, uh, the artist will just uh, copy something, but side by side and uh, he can replicate w whatever he wants. It's, it's, very, it's very nice, it can be used for uh, uh, educational purposes, like uh, our university had uh, um, a big project of doing these uh, very nice uh, models to teach our, our med students. It's very nice, but it's really not the reality, so um, they, they can print it, uh, but to, to make it something real, they would have to scan or to take several pictures of, of a given object. And when you take several pictures and they, they have the software that they are going to an analyze the difference of every point of those images and make a 3D map, just like uh, 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 this image here that was uh, several pictures from this building, and then they, they plot it into a, a 3D map and they can put this model in the computer. So here I took the two pictures of the, of the cerebellum and then I, uh, uh, you can create this model easily with the computer just with two pictures and uh, the computer can, can see the depth if you, or you can project this image too with stereoscopically and see this floating in the air. You can take several pictures for small objects, for example, here is a vertebra, and then you can put in in the software and then and then move it. So you create a, a, a 3D model from the, the real thing itself. You can even use it for uh, bigger objects. Here is a head, I took many pictures of the head, and then I, I put it here and you, you can see it's fairly good. Okay, well, you can uh, you can trace an, an object. This is another solution. You can go tracing the object, and uh, uh, the shape will be brought into the computer as the same thing. Or you can scan. Uh, there are solutions with like uh, the Kinect uh, can be adapted. It's it's cheap, and you can adapt it for the for it for it to scan something. So here. It is being used to uh, scan a, a person. It's easy. And then you can later project it. Or there are solutions more accurate than uh, can be used for medical usage because they have a higher accuracy. So here is sold um, even for the iPad. But this is the best that I found. Uh, uh, probably our university will buy it so we can scan some anatomical specimens. It has the accuracy of one tenth of a millimeter. Appears to be nice. And here is like uh, the person here just uh, scanned a machine. And then later on, the, this mesh, this 3D map is plotting to, to the computer.
Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>